School of Forensic Science. Welcome everyone on behalf of National Forensic Science University to this expert lecture on the advancing justice through the DNA technology. Today we are fortunate to have us with Dr. Dragon Primorek, a very renowned and distinguished personality in the field of forensic. With great pleasure, I begin with brief introduction to of Dr. Pragon, Professor Pragon. Uh, Professor Dragon Primorek, MD, PhD. He is a pediatrician, forensic expert, and genetist. Professor Primorek is the first recipient of the title Global Penn State University Ambassador since the university was established in 1855. Currently, he serves as the chair of the International Affairs Committee of the American Academy of Forensic Science and as a professor at Eberly College of Science, the Pennsylvania State University and Henry Seal College of Criminal Justice and Forensic Science, University of the New Haven in the United States, and as a professor at medical school in Split, Riyak, and Osiak, as well as the Regiomet Medical School in Germany. In October 2016, he was appointed as a visiting professor at the College of Medicine and Forensic. Zian Tia Uthang, University People's Republics of China. He authored 250 scientific papers and abstract as well as 20 books chapter. Professor Primorek has been invited to give a lecture at 120 conference all around the world. His work was published in most cited journal including Science and Nature. So far his paper have been cited almost 6,000 times while H index is 33. He was mentoring 12 PhD students and two students during their master's degree process. In the early 90s, together with colleagues from the USA, he was pioneering DNA identification of skeleton human remains found in mass graves. Currently, he is initiating the application of the personalized medicine paradigm in clinical practice. In 1997, Professor Primorek co-founded the International Society of the Applied Biological Science. He is also the founder of the Nobel Spread sessions held during the ISABS conferences when the Nobel Prize laureate stimulated public discussion. Professor Primorek currently serves the executive committee member of the International Consortium for the Personalized Medicine. He is the president of the state competitiveness clusters in personalized medicine, the Croatian Society for Human Genetics, the Croatian Society for Personalized Medicine, and the Croatian Thematic Innovative Council for the Health and Life Quality. Currently, he serves as the member of the Croatian Prime Minister Scientific Committee established to fight COVID-19. In 2011, he established St. Catherine Speciality Hospital, the European Center of Excellence. In 2009, he co-founded the Department of Forensic Science at the University of Svilit, Croatia. While in 2015, he was the instrumental in establishing the Regiomet Medical School in Bavaria, Germany. Professor Primorek received 21 domestic and international awards. In 2015, Professor Primorek received state decoration the order of the Croatian star with the effigy of the Ruder Boscovic. In 2018, the order of the Ant Star Kavik. In 2019, Mary E. Cowan, Outstanding Service Award for the Excellence. Renowned medical outlets have reported on the result of his work, such as the New York Times, USA, USA Today, and Chicago Tribune. From 2003 to 2000, 2009, he served as a Ministry of Science, Education, and Sports of the Republic of the Croatia. Dr. Primorek also held the distinctions of the promoting sports in European countries and United States. Dr. Primorek has been awarded honorary membership in many scientific organizations. Likewise, there are many more accolades that Dr. Primorek has achieved over the years 
list is long and personality of this magnitude will require entire session for the introduction so i now hand over the meet to professor prime thank you sir please thank you thank you indeed it's a great pleasure to be with you and uh, let's check is it everything working is supposed to work and please just confirm that you see is it fine okay I, I hope you see the slide do you let me just okay could you please confirm that you see the slides yes sir visible yes, sir. fine sir. yeah great so as you can see my life is quite complicated and uh, you know living between at least four countries and i'm proudly just uh, including the, the the my title of professor emeritus at national forensic science university in india and uh, as, as a former minister i'm just going to introduce you a few slides before i start with my lecture just to tell you about importance of, of university education it doesn't matter who is discussing united nations european commission everyone is talking about priority on the growth and uh, and how to be more competitive you know on the other hand if you see the nobel prize laureate solo he's going to tell you that about 80 percent of the gross domestic product is result from new technology or innovation that's why I was checking the recent ranking by Shanghai ranking, and you always see that innovation at the top, research is on the top, and the third place is taking publications. So if you compare what we do in the States, I was always comparing what we do in the EU and the States, and it's easy to see that out of the top 20 universities are coming from the United States of America. And it's always question, why is that happening? You know, primarily to the small class sizes, highly accredited professors, advanced technology, and the research. And that's the message I would like to share with you. It is very clear that from my Penn State University and some others, it's very important that you study the subject you can and you love. That you're always included in the part of the research that is going to be part of your destiny or your future. And indeed, the model of the campuses is critical, so you exchange your minds, ideas, and everything. And what is very good, doesn't matter if you're foreigners, when you're coming back to the States, you are feeling that you are part of the society. Indeed, you know, first day after graduation, you are having opportunities, and you are trying to be independently minded people as much as possible. So here are the Ivy League universities, and. Uh, you know, some of them, yeah, I'm sure you are very, very familiar. And uh, basically, I was trying to put on a few sentences why those Ivy League universities are the best in the world. It's always issue of infrastructure, traditional people, help to the students, quality of the faculty, and indeed about the amount of the money invested in research, publications, and diversity, which is, in my opinion, critical. International collaboration and the students playing a very important role. And indeed, you know, the power of alumni, it's always very important. So when I defined many years ago about new model of education, I was thinking, should we call that the future of the university or university of the future or the future of the university education in the 22nd century? But dear colleagues, let me tell you, it doesn't matter how we're going to call it. Most likely, it will be the future of university education, 22nd century. I would like just briefly to show you slides of the great man, of the Gandhi, who was telling you, really, everything depends on what you do today. So you are making decision about your destiny today. You are making decision about your future. You are making decision how excellent are you going to be. And many students in the States, in Israel, Germany, they're asking me, what do I mean by the excellence? I think we have to agree about one thing today. Excellence is becoming the minimum standard. 
it's not anymore an event, it's rather commitment. So I'm having collaboration for 18 years with the best United States hospital, Mayo Clinic, and I was always looking why this hospital is the leading one, always ahead of the Cleveland, the Hopkins, some others. They're applying something what we call translational science, where the basic science is having direct interaction with the industry or what we call application. If you see what is happening in the medicine, and in a few seconds I'll be starting my lecture, it's very clear that you are not able to have a leading position if you are not integrating the knowledge from the basic science to the clinical medicine. And it's particularly happening on the completely new era, era of the omics technology. Because you cannot deny that today we've been talking about uh, best in the field of the genetics, but there are a few new, completely new different fields, including, you know, I'm not going to go into details, but analysis of the proteins, sugars, analysis of the metabolism of the lipids. So it's incredible knowledge that we should use and we are still using in a, in a clinical medicine. But if you are going to switch toward the forensic medicine, we have to understand how we can benefit from the every single different changes that each of us is having. So basically, it doesn't matter what you do. In forensic science, you always have to have more evidence than speculations. And I'm in forensic science for almost 30 years and uh, thousands and thousands of the cases. And only when we have headache was when we have not enough evidence where the lawyers, judges, and everyone including made more speculation than was necessary. But if the crime rate is rising in one country, there's no any doubt that economy is going down. And in the early 90s, I was always shocked when I see so many people with a camera entering autopsy room, asking us for advice. You know, I didn't have any clue they're going to do crime scene investigation movies and everything. So they were very, very smart. They were learning from our experience. But unfortunately, in only few cases you are dealing, like what the next slide is going to show you, very clear cut cause of disease. Or also, unfortunately, you are rarely having situation that you have enough biological or some other traces that you're able to solve. That's why this slide is very, very important. Because each of you are having very unique message or changes, either in your DNA or some other molecules in your body, that makes you very, very unique. And what we understand today, it doesn't matter from which part of the world you are coming, you always have a DNA difference about 0.1%. So basically, here is the molecule of the DNA that we are really spending so much time and energy in order to understand what is happening. And we also know that if you're having functional genes, you are making protein, you are healthy. But for a while, we didn't know that the number of the genes, it's not proportional to the, I would say, organism complexity. And we've been shocked when we realized that, for example, if you're comparing the mouse genome and the number of the gene in the mouse, which is having 23,796, you just figure out that mouse is having more than 100 genes than the human. But it's still mouse, we can agree, it's not more complex than human. I think if you compare with the polyhouse dubium, amyloid organism, it's absolutely amazing. It's about 200 times larger genome than what is in a human. You know, so we have to change the concept of thinking about complexity. And we all know that our future, our destiny is designed by the 23 pairs of the chromosomes. We also know that two copies of our genome is in each of our cell. And we know that we are having about 3.2 billion base pairs of different letters in our genome. But as I said, there's a only different 0.1% between each of us, but still 
enough that we can see during the criminal investigation who committed the crime. But from perspective as a clinician, I was always shocked to see that only 1.5 to 3% of the genome codes the proteins, and we are functioning because of the protein. But I'm even more shocked when the recent data showing us that we cannot agree about the number of the genes that we are having. So if you see what Salzberg or gene code or reef sex are showing, you know, the variations from the 21,000 to 19,000 to 20,000. But is it matter or does it matter and how important? It is important, particularly if we don't understand, we should not be arrogant and we should take more time to understand what is happening with what we call protein coding genes and what we are calling non-coding genes. But in our lives, working as a forensic scientist, it's critical to understand that one cell is having about six picograms of the DNA. So if you see a micro, non, micro, nine pico, you are coming to the point that you are talking that one picogram, it's about 978 meg megabase. And basically from this, we realize that we need about, I would say three to six cells to identify the person, to identify perpetrator, to identify who was killed, or to identify who committed the crime. So that's critical information. So basically, according to the, our knowledge, we know that we are able to amplify somewhere between 15 and 20 picograms. And if you see that one cell is giving you six, it's very clear to know that between three and six cells should be enough for you to get entire profile. So how to describe genetics to the students? I'm using these slides and telling if the child looks like the father, it's genetics, but if the child looks like the neighbor, it could be epigenetics or environmental issues. Indeed, the life is not such uh, simple. And uh, the recent data that I'm having with my uh, partners showing that the power of genetics is remarkable. Basically, about 7.2% of the all positive results we are receiving from genetic testing are having significant variants that are linked with either cardiovascular or the cancer risk genes. And your question could be, Professor, why every single day we are not getting cancer? Because we are having so many of those mutations. It's simply because we are having DNA repair mechanism, which is correcting certain mutations. And what we know is that each of our cells experiencing about 10,000 induced damages of the DNA per day. And if you don't have such a perfect mechanism, you're going to get disease. So next slide, you see Paul Modric, we discussed for hours, fantastic man and Nobel Prize laureate, the guy who discovered a DNA repair mechanism and who he completely agree with the model. It's not easy to understand how cell perfectly working in order to correct any kind of the damages at the DNA in order to allow us to live normally and not having cancer basically every day. But the power of the genetics was understood by many. He is the President Clinton and the Collins and the Venter they are pushing every single dollar in order to get new technology in order to make a progress. The same happened with President Obama. He was also putting a lot of money in order to have genetics working in the field of the personalized medicine. And I'm telling you about power of genetics. Everything what I'm going to show you today mainly are my original data. Please remember during the last 30 years and some data from my books. I'm in charge of the Croatian Medical Committee of the Croatian uh, Football Federation. And uh, it's fantastic because Croatia, as you know, it's vice champions on the world. Some of the most famous players are working closely with us, like Modric, Rakitic, Mandzukic, all these fantastic young fellows. 
But unfortunately, you witnessed recently what's happening with a player called Ericsson. You know, he just fainted. And everyone was worried what is going on. And what we knew from before, that sudden cardiac death happening among players. And unfortunately, everyone is talking about sudden cardiac death, but only a few days and during the event. So what we decided, we decided to mobilize all possible powers and our partner in Vita from San Francisco, together with St. Catherine Hospital, we have the model, and this model is applying 900, sorry, 294 different genes, which they are related with conditions that can lead to the sudden cardiac death. And there's a fantastic group of the people involved in this study, and we actually invited Ericsson to come and to be tested in St. Catherine Hospital. It's uh, absolutely amazing which kind of the results you're able to get. In this particular slide, we are following at least three different generations. You're able to see the player who died. You're able to see the family members with a certain red colors, and those are mutation on the genes. You're able to follow up all those mutations to the father, to the mother, to the grandmother, and indeed, you're able to prevent sudden cardiac death. But in many forensic cases, you know, there's a literature claiming that about 30% of the people who die, there is no certain cause of the death. And that's one of the best methodology that you're able to link if the sudden cardiac death is a reason of the death. And for you who are involved in forensic genetics, it's very clear that mainly we are interested to work with uh, what we call nuclear DNA. But in the case that we don't have enough nuclear DNA, you are very much interested in working with mitochondrial DNA. And mitochondrial DNA is very unique, it's coming from the mother. You have a lot of, lot of copies comparing with only two copies of the nuclear DNA. And what make us all, I would say, very, very happy, in most cases, where you are not able to get enough information from the nuclear DNA, you are able to get from the mitochondrial DNA. But as I said, life is not easy as we expected. So the question why we are only having the mitochondrial DNA from the mother, it's defined in this slide, because it's showing you that all mitochondrials are located in the neck of the sperm. And if you are having conception, so it's very clear that only portion of the sperm with the sharing genetical material is coming from the head and not from the neck. So basically, it's very simple to conclude that only mitochondrial DNA is coming from the mother. So it's very important to understand that in order to understand results what we are getting. It's always three possible outcomes when you are doing crime scene analysis, paternity cases, or something else. You either match, you do exclusion, or you are not able to get enough data, either because of the mixture, either you are not having enough materials, doesn't matter. But basically you are having situation that you have to do things differently. That was the reason why on early 90s, we use a very simple rule developed by Einstein and he was telling you, we cannot solve problems by using the same kind of the thinking we use when we create it. So we have to change the concept in order to get more results. That's what he was telling. Most or actually of those you will be able to find in my book. Actually, we are just about to publish second edition of the book called Forensic DNA Application, published in the United States by CRC Press, Francis and Taylor. It's actually during the group promotion with very close friends from Connecticut and New York State Police, and I believe that Henry Lee is your professor as well. And uh, in order to understand interpretation of data, you have to understand forensic 
uh, statistics, which quite simple. It's really depending what are you doing. If you are doing uh, estimation, if you have allele frequency, or if you are having only heterozygote, or if you are having homozygote, those are very easy formulas to calculate and to get final outcome, what we call the likelihood ratio or probability of identification. So if you have the frequency on the certain alleles in the population, you just multiply them, you are having combined frequency. And that's the way how we are calculating identification of the certain people. And uh, by having so many different alleles that you are analyzing, you are coming, for example, in this concrete case, that likelihood ratio originate from this particular suspect, it's about 237 billion times greater than any other person who was randomly selected from the population. It was not always like that. What you see here is the Croatia. Croatia, it's in the middle of the Southeast Europe, and you are having Bosnia on the border. Unfortunately, we have a war. Croatia and Bosnia, they were attacked from Serbia in the early 90s. And so many articles, so many victims, and what was happening. It's happening that every morning when I come to the work, I see parents crying, crying because they lost their loved ones, and nobody is able to identify those people. Please remember, we are talking before the DNA application was standardly used as the procedure. And by the way, the publication that we did it on 1993-1994, it was first publication showing clear data that you are able to identify skeletal remains from mass grave. So there's a typical crime scene during the war. So many different problems, including landmines that you have to dig on location that you don't understand anything about that. Sometimes you may have sniper fire and it was huge risk. And you have to keep in mind a few very, very important facts that actually we are using today routinely in forensic science. The number one, the perpetrator will take away traces of the victim and the scene. Or the victim will retain traces of the perpetrator and may have leave traces himself on the perpetrator. Or the perpetrator will leave traces of himself at the scene. So these three scenarios are critical and very, very important if you would like to do successful identification. And I would like to share with you a few very important rules. And those are very simple. Do it right the first time, you get only one chance. It's your case. You have only one shot at the crime scene, so make sure that you are doing right. But the most important is to protect and preserve crime scene because I'm not sure if the technology that I'm using today is going to be sufficient that I achieve identity of somebody. Please keep in mind that some evidence is better than no evidence. And the final one, which I love and I hope you will remember this for the rest of your career. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. After many years, after 20 years, I realized that's exactly true and that's exactly correct. Because what I was not able to solve in the early 90s because I did not have technology, I saved. And on 2020, we were able to get enough DNA and we were able to identify either perpetrator or the victim. But anyhow, in your routine work, it's a critical to remember what I'm going to show you in the next slide. The teamwork is paramount to success. Without teamwork, you're not able to do much. Doesn't matter, you can be genius, you can be DNA expert, you can be expert for doing any kind of the traces, but without teamwork, you are not able to do much. So I always put teamwork on the position number one. Documentation, it's a critical. Preservation of evidence, 
very critical. To use common sense, indeed, for all of you who are in forensics, it's very important. And to adapt to the new technology and think differently, it's what I call flexibility. And I'm sure that you understand. What you see here at the body that came directly from the mass grave, and actually the mass grave that I work with had more than 50 different bodies. So what are you going to do with this? If you don't have brilliant forensic pathologists, forensic anthropologists, if you don't have good, I would say, person who is involved in the dentistry or in the anthropology, if they are not able to put together all skeletal remains, if they are not able to analyze all traces, you have a big problem. So here is a concrete situation when we have the family members coming on 1992. So two of my colleagues and I'm taking photo, we are standing with the parents. And they've been told that this body in front of them is their son. And indeed, it's almost impossible to accept that. There's no evidence. They didn't have dental record. DNA, during that time we just started, among first ones in the world. But what are you going to do if you have something like this? Thousand people being killed in different places all around the world. And what you see, it's uh, the mass grave from Vukovar, where completely innocent people, hundreds of them, being killed with idea of the perpetrator that nobody ever will be able to identify them. You know, we were really pioneering an early 90s remarkable work and everyone wanted to learn more. So I have interviews at Chicago Tribune, we have interviews with the New York Times, and either the, the, the wife of the President Bush was involved in my project together with the family from the Kennedy. And indeed, Professor Henry, my dear friend, was always with me. So about 20 years after first identification, the President came and he was telling me, my mother is sending you best regards, it's President Bush. But I would like to thank this fantastic group of the people and hopefully you will be able to meet them. The first on the left, it's uh, Tim Palbach from the Connecticut State Police and then Mitch Holland from the United States Army. Unfortunately, my dear friend Moses Shanfield passed away. You see Haskell Pitlock Judge, Henry Lee, Michael Bader, who was director of the New York State Police Forensic Laboratory. That was photo on the early 90s from United States Armed Force Institute of Pathology. And on crime scene, when you are doing cases, you are always able to find something that you have preserved for the future time. That's exactly what you are doing either on the autopsy table or you are collecting all these evidences. And this is a particular grave came from the north part of Croatia where you're having a lot of humidity. So during that time, I was not sure why we are not getting enough DNA, why the profile is very, very unclear. Later on, we realized that these particular fields are having a lot of what we call heavy metals or bacterial contamination, which interfering with our PCR reaction. And uh, you're working all day. You are coming from the States. We flew from the States, we landed to Croatia and Bosnia, working day and nights. So don't be surprised if you see so many photos that every single minute you are using just to sleep. But indeed, for you as a student, it's critical to understand the methodology. So identification of remains by a living person who knew the person by direct facial recognition, it's critical. Fingerprints analysis indeed, dentition indeed, special features, tattoos, scars, very important. Recognition of the clothing, belongings, autopsy finding, forensic anthropologists involved, reconstruction of the facial features, hair comparison. And please remember that all those methodology do not work. DNA, it's methodology of the choice.
But doesn't matter even if you have technology, if you don't have enough information. But the most critical part, it's always linked with experience of the forensic team members. Indeed, the people who identify thousands and thousands of people, they're in much better shoes than people who are just beginners. Just to tell you how difficult our work was. When we started in 1991, we had about 80,000 people missing. On 2014, we are having 1,663. And today we are having about 1,000 missing people because we are not able to find the graves. And pe perpetrators are very, very, very careful because if we found the grave, we may put them on court because they're responsible. So that they're protecting all these evidences and they're not giving information to the, anyone. So if you see the number of the people that we execute or identify the ratio, it's extremely, extremely high. We worked on uh, 135 different grades. You can imagine how painful work is that. But even more difficult in the Bosnia because they were missing about 35,000 people. And uh, all these informations are today part of the history. But I would like to show you a photo from the, my laboratory. Actually, it was first laboratory, the best of my knowledge, who produced the data, identification, DNA identification of skeletal remains from the mass grave and made me very, very, very proud. On the 1996, Michael Blood, Henry Lee, Barbara Wolf, myself, and my group, we published the first paper showing scientific community that you're able to identify skeletal remains from mass grave if you have the family members who gave you biological specimen or trace. Indeed, you always have to be careful because once when you have all these bones from the graves, you have to understand what's happening. So there's so many cases that I was receiving bones like that and that I'm not able to identify bone below. Indeed, later on we found that those bones belonging to the animals because people who committed the crime, they mixed human and animal bones together in order to make our life more difficult. However, every time when we found the teeth, I know that situation will be much easier. Because what we know from the past, the teeth are having animal on the top and protecting brilliantly dentin and the rest of the teeth. So we are having thousands and thousands and thousands of the cells comparing with the compact bone, which is still having enough cells. So femur or phibia. But unfortunately, with spongy bone, the flat bone, you are having few cells. So the DNA indeed will be disappearing after a certain period of time much faster from the flat bone or the spongy bone comparing with the teeth or the compact bone. So the story about DNA is always the same. How to isolate enough DNA, how to purify, how to amplify, and which kind of technology you should use. When we started, we started with HLA, DQ alpha typing. Then we moved with STRs. We move completely new technology and then we introduce Y chromosome analysis. Then we started with mitochondrial DNA sequencing. We apply a bunch of different, different technology because the very primitive one basically is telling you that on nylon membrane you are having sequence, label sequence. So if you amplify the DNA with a certain mutation, hybrid is happening and because of different changes of the color, you're going to see different profiles. Then we move a little bit on with technology. Then we went to the variable number tandem repeats because we are looking for the different number, number of the repeats. Presumably this person is having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, comparing with the three. So whoever is going to be father or mother of this particular person has to have one of these alleles. And uh, it's very simple. The numbers of the repeats it's what we are using when we analyze sample on the STR. So, for example, if this particular person is homozygote, is having equal number of the repeats, it's having only one peak. But if that person is heterozygote, it means it is having one 
allele on the six repeats and the second one on nine so it's six and nine and only what you have to know is what is the frequency on the certain alleles in population and if you multiply them you're going to get information what are the chances that somebody randomly from the population is having the same profile so here are some preliminary results during that period we were able to see there is a particular case of the x chromosome because you are having female comparing with the male that should give you two different bands and then you are analyzing every time are you or somebody else is homozygote heterozygote and please keep in mind that if you are looking for y chromosome you have to understand that y chromosome is passing from the father to the son and son to the son but autosomal dna it's passing jointly from the father and the mother to the son this concrete situation but if you're having mitochondrial dna situation is completely different mother is passing to the daughter and daughter is passing to the son but because of the reason i explained to you earlier a son is not able to pass mitochondrial dna for their kids and it's incredibly important to understand this slide in order to understand what we do in real life so here's a situation of the real life we are having missing individual that we are able to under, to identify either analyzing son or daughter or mother or father or brother and so on and again whatever you do you are having three possible outcome match exclusion or inconclusive but you have full right to ask me error rate in forensic dna testing indeed mishandling contamination or misinterpretation of the results so please keep that in mind when we did such pioneering work all scientific community was incredibly interested so jama published entire article about our work science published and even they put me on the covers on the profiles and dna with all these bonds and my question was always why forensic scientists are having so many problems by working with old bones once again i'm coming back to einstein that's insanity doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results that's why we created the european str working group i was leading so we published a lot so we changed so many different procedures in order to get brilliant dna so we know how to do it we know which technology to use we know that we have to get rid of the garbage we know that we have to do solving three to two to three millimeters in the deep so every single procedure we publish in order to get 96 percent sufficiency or rate of the success by working with the bone but still here are the most important questions we ask if application failed do we have enough dna what is the level of dna degradation or how much potential pcr inhibitors we are having so indeed you are having some of the challenges by using quantifier you have to quantify your dna and indeed we published a bunch of these articles comparing what we started in below where you for example having 0.165 nanograms and you are comparing what you are having that's old and primitive technology then we moved a little bit later on and we realized when you are using strs you are having so many false negative quantum bot results and it's a big problem on the court because if you are showing this day at the court the judge is going to ask you how possible is that you are getting profile and when your quantum blot is showing you, you have nothing Today it's much better because, as I told you at the beginning, we are capable of getting profile of the 50 picograms and even less. In some cases, I'll be showing you a few seconds. And if you remember that per cell, you are having about 6 picograms. And if you move a little bit later, you see that you are able to get 19 picogram detection limits. So you need between 3 and 6 cells. To get the profile which is absolutely amazing so what we are doing we are doing for so many different samples that we had at the beginning of the war and success rate was about 79 80 percent 
with 30 to 12 picograms per microliter. I told you that my students was working heavily to see what are the inhibitors of the PCR and the fion, the iron, copper, cadmium, lead are the most important. And we did all these testings in order to get a result. Indeed, we tested a bunch of the bones and we concluded that influence of the metal ion on, on the PCR is remarkable. Then we move later on and we ask ourselves how far we can go in the past in order to get results. So we came back to the Spanish Civil War and uh, we are able to purify by using silica columns, able to get profiles from 20 picograms per microliter, which is absolutely amazing. And here are some of the results when you're doing different dilutions. And indeed, I would like to show you the recent technology where you are getting very, very clean profile and without any hesitation, you can figure out which profile is that. Indeed, that you remember what we discussed about mitochondrial DNA. You have about 1,000 of the copies. You are getting to the maternal line and that's the technology we use when we are trying to get the profile. So that technology we are using for years. And it's very simple because you are having certain polymorphisms. And if you're amplified mitochondrial DNA for pre perpetrator or for the person to try and identify match this sequence, you are go going to get the certain labels. So I worked for the certain period with the Roche in order to develop or to work on this technology. And indeed, you have to compare that with the sequencing. So even the paper we published on that topic, we did so many different cases. We figure out what is going on with the sequencing. And indeed, we move later on to the many is STRs. So it's very interesting data, because if I'm going to show you the likelihood ratio, or let's say probability for paternity, every single case that we work, it's 99.999999. So you're having more than 10 nines in order to have data that is accepted on the court. So let me show you briefly a few cases. The murder trial of the O.J. Simpson, very famous in June 30, 1994. Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Lai Goldman were found murdered. Bunch of the blood, but indeed its blood was found from the both of them, from Nicole and from the Ronald. And actually, in a few cases, Henry, Tim, and the rest of the gang, they found some blood drops. But O.J. Simpson was telling it, it's my house. I cut myself, nothing related with the murder. Then you have to do a certain, you know, nail typing. And that's the photo that uh, O.J. sent me from the prison to Dragon Peace to you. And it's a Henry during the trial. And a few cases very interesting, which I was shocked to see. For example, it was few unexplained blood droplets of the Nicole Brown Simpson body on the neck. And they were completely overlooked and ignored. But even more shocking, all this blood was washed in the medical examiner office. You can imagine which kind of mistake that, because if we have blood droplets, we are able to see who was killing her. Unfortunately, that's not only one problem that we have found. The following problem that we found, that Detective Mark Furman was alone outside of the crime scene for 18 minutes. But if you have 8 milliliters of the blood drawn, and if you found that only 6.5 milliliters been tested, what's happened with 1.5 milliliters? Presumably somebody was using that. But original LAPD's note did not mention that blood as found on the socks. And what really make me concerned that uh, Dr. Reeder, fantastic toxicologist, found EDTA, a blood preservative, on the blood that was found on the crime scene. EDTA. It's not present in your or my blood. It could only come from the laboratory. So that's the reason why in a court of law, any evidence which have been 
obtained illegally is subject to being excluded by the trial judge. And that's the way how entire American system of jurisprudence is grounded in the concept of equal protection and fair play for all. And that's why O.J. Simpson was released. And it was very clear that the statement was made because of the big mistakes related to the DNA analysis. However, we are having few other cases, including the case with the President Kennedy and Monica Lewinsky about famous dress with a famous sperm. And at the beginning, beginning, the President denying that he has any influence with his sperm. But forensic expert told him that he has only little chance there is uh, somebody else with his genetic profile in the world. So indeed, he admitted and the trial was concluded. But anyhow, forensic scientists always making jokes and they said the shape of the regular DNA looks like this and the President Clinton looks like this. Just a joke. Then we are having so many different cases that we work on the Vincent Foster case, and if you speak with, with the Professor Lee, he's going to tell you more about that. But I would like to show you one case that I was visiting immediately after that happened, World Trade Center, and it was horrible, completely disaster, unexperienced people. That's me working with the Connecticut State Police and colleagues from Israel. And uh, at the crime scene, you are able to see so many, so many different pieces incredible amount of the of the garbage so every single sample was passing analyzing you are able to see the human remains then you are seeing the traces metals and everything what was in the building then you are washing collecting so see how dirty this part and right now it's washed and then you are using very simple technology that we used 20 years ago. So you are having samples. If you see the extracts, extracts going to certain laboratories. And then you are having swab and then you're having personal effect, bone and the tissue. And each of these institutions giving you profile and finally you are matching the profile and that's how you are identifying people. That's exactly what we do on the barrack in Croatia when this particular barrack exploded and we have six people killed and you can imagine the temperature that exists and during that we were able to identify certain people are using DNA technology but very very stressful case was that we work on the second world war graves in Slovenia close to Ljubljana Skofia Loka and almost if you see the the period so we are talking about 60 years, it was completely gap for all these people that were killed. And uh, I would say almost everyone from the family, it's already dead. But anyhow, we were able to get the blood samples from some relatives and from all these graves and people who were killed 60 years ago, we are able to get successful profiles, do analysis and publish one of the first papers that we make possible to identify victims from the Second World War. You know, the profile is oh, it's almost brilliant, pure, clean, and here are our results. So in almost every single case where we have the family members, we had positive identification. In this concrete case, one, two, three, four. In the cases where we did not have anyone to compare, indeed, we are not able to get results. But what is the conclusion? DQ alpha and polymarker were helpful in about 25 to 30 percent cases. STR is helping with about 90 percent of the cases. Anyhow, mitochondrial DNA is able to help you in the rest. But anyhow, it's critical to have appropriate DNA database. So all this, I published a lot of times, telling you how important is DNA degradation level, type of skeletal remains, DNA extraction methods the percentage of the enzyme inhibitors, amplification products showing strongly amplification if you have shorter, smaller size, and indeed the quality. Most of this you'll be able to find in the book that I just told you, and we are including some other things, and I need about eight to nine minutes to conclude my lecture, 
it's a recent technology that we are using. Right now, we are able to distinguish, is it male or female? We are able to distinguish the biological traits coming from the blood, skin, semen. We are able to enter area of the forensic phenotyping. If you find the biological trace, you are able by analyzing certain SMPs, figure out about color of the perpetrator. Is it blue or some different color? And then you're able to do calculation. But what makes me very happy, Professor Lautz and myself, by using glycans, we were able to establish, you'll be shocked, approximately, I would say in 5,000 5, samples, we're able to establish approximate age of the person who committed the crime. And everything by using the glycans. Then we use the same concept in order to trace people from which part of the world are they coming. Africa, Asia. Indeed, forensic botany and animal forensics is one of our priority. We work strongly on the different STR markers because if you are having uh, hair from the, from the cat on the clothes, you are just comparing the profiles. Right now, big challenge is uh, to work on the plants. And that's something that a uh, group from the Connecticut State Police published article in my book, Working on Marijuana and especially about clonal propagation. And if you are following this data, you are able to come almost to the garden of the person who is growing marijuana. Bioterrorism and forensic microbiology is one of our priorities. And if you remember correctly, we are particularly worried about anthrax at the beginning and botulism plug and so many. But right now with molecular, we are able to easily come to the point. So. I'm just going to skip a few of these slides and I would like to show you that if you are using correctly your markers, you're able to enter deeply on forensic genealogy. So that's our paper that we published in the science on 2000, where you're able to follow the migrations and certain mutations for almost 25, 30,000 years ago. And you're able to see DNA test results actually as reports. That's what we do on a regular basis. But DNA as evidence in the courtroom is very powerful. It's powerful because you are able to change destiny of many. If you don't have certain species, you're not able to solve the case. So that's why this statement from Virginia was made that, very simple, we have had over 500 cases to offender hits and 85% of these hits would not, would be missed if Virginia did not have this particular DNA database. My interest also is to follow human trafficking, which is a global problem. 27 million victims only in 2012. It's huge industry, amazing industry. But if you see these innocent kids, if you see what are happening with this, I think each of us motivated to, to run and to go with this concept. So I believe strongly that uh, I have a few more slides to show you and for some reason I lost it, but let me just, let me just show you a few more and then, okay, it's just opening. It's a huge presentation for one hour, but I wanted to share with you the past, present and the future. And uh, hopefully this presentation will open because we are investing very much so on education. And uh, one of our centers, and I'm going to show you in a few minutes, was the one of the first forensic scientific program actually that, that we have in the, in the Europe on that scale. And I'm coming in one second to that particular slide. Okay, and hopefully I will be able to, to put presentation. Okay, it's right there. So when you visit us next time, you'll be able to see our new Forensic Institute where we are doing a bunch of the practical work and even we are bringing students to the field 
as students working with us on the field, actually there's a case from the Second World War where we are analyzing different skeletal remains, cleaning, and finally extracting DNA. So our students are very competitive in the market, very, very competitive. We are having very strong collaboration with my Penn State University, and every other year we are putting all this top new knowledge during the conferences that we are having in Croatia in collaboration with Mayo Clinic, John Washington University, Penn State University, New Haven, with participation of three to five Nobel Prize laureates. You see here Robert Huber, Ada Jonath, and Harald Zurkhausen. And we are giving awards to the best forensic students from worldwide in order to have that career. And what is really important to tell you that next June from 22nd to 29, we are having the conference in Dubrovnik where we are going to cover all recent technologies from the field of the clinical and forensic medicine. So indeed, I hope you will be able to come. And I would like to conclude with the last slide. For all of you who are today's students, but tomorrow will be the leaders. Destiny is not a matter of chance. It's a matter of the choice. It's not a thing to be waited for. It's a thing to be achieved. I would like to thank you so much for your patience. And I'm open for any question that you may have. Thank you, sir, for giving us your time and your excellent sessions. Thank you. Your stimulating lecture gave us several new insight in DNA technology. On behalf of National Forensic Science University, I am very grateful for your gracious presence. We hope to see you soon personally. Absolutely. I am really looking forward. In the meantime, if you are coming, of any of you coming to Europe, please let me know. I'll be flying to the United States in a few days, but I'll be back in August. Yes. So are, are there any questions by students or by somebody? Or if not, I think you have other lectures to, to go with the program. No, Thank you. Very much, sir. All the best. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.